morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Global Neurosciences Institute Grand Round Series. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Tina Levin. Dr. Levin is an assistant professor of neurosurgery at Drexel University College of Medicine. She graduated from New York College of Osteopathic Medicine and completed neurosurgery residence at North Shore Lish Hofstra Medical School that was followed by pediatric neurosurgery fellowship at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital of Stanford University. Dr. Lovin is a director of pediatric neurosurgery at Global Neurosciences Institute and head of that division at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children. She is well published at NOVA regionally and internationally. Dr. Tina Lovin will be speaking today about abusive head trauma. Dr. Lovin. Thank you so much, Dr. Glebus, for your kind presentation and, and uh, uh, good morning to everybody. Um, Today, I'm gonna to be talking about a topic um, that uh, we, most of us, including myself, would like to um, close our eyes and just uh, think that it doesn't exist. Uh, but unfortunately, child maltreatment has been around as long as humans have been around. Uh, no ancient civilization um, considered child uh, protection to be a governmental function. And in all ancient uh, um, civilizations, uh, including ancient Rome, fathers were vested unlimited rights over children, including corporal punishment and uh, infanticide. If there was uh, something wrong with the child, if they had some kind of uh, um, physical malformation, um, they were usually um, killed. Um, two centuries ago, um, child maltreatment was wide press, uh, spread and uh, child labor was common. Um, in the 19th century, pathologists uh, studying filicide, which is actually um, parental killing of children, reported cases of death from paternal rage. And in the uh, 1860s, uh, a paper series uh, was first uh, um, published uh, um, of 32 cases uh, of uh, uh, child uh, maltreatment uh, out of 18 of which were fatal. In 1874, there was a uh, famous case uh, of uh, uh, Mary Ellen, who was a child in uh, Hell's Kitchen section of New York who was abused for years uh, by her parents. And that's the first case was, uh, that was actually criminally prosecuted. The neighbors uh, kept reporting this family and uh, uh, finally the authorities got involved and the child was uh, taken out of the um, parents' uh, uh, guardianship and put into foster care. Uh, Mary Ellen, uh, lived a uh, um, long life and uh, got married, had her own children and uh, died in the 50s uh, at the age of 92. So that's somebody who was saved who probably would have ended up um, very badly if uh, not intervened. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, more evidence began to accumulate from pathologists and uh, radiologist reports and in 1962, uh, one of the first reports was uh, uh, published. Um, this was a, a Kempe's battered child syndrome. And in 1974, um, the uh, Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act uh, was enacted. So um, there was a um, very um, kind of a touching little sentence that I included here where um, I was reviewing the literature about child abuse by Ian Hacking, who is a Canadian uh, philosopher. Um, some evil actions are public. Maybe genocide is the most awful. Other evil actions are private, a matter of one person harming another or self-inflicted injury. Child abuse in our current reckoning is the worst of private evils. We want to put a stop to it. We know we can do that, not entirely. We know we can't do that, not entirely. Human wickedness 
or disease, if that's your picture of abuse, won't go away. But we must protect as many children as we can. We want also to discover and help those who have already been hurt. Anyone who feels differently is already something of a monster. Abusive head trauma has an estimated incidence of 20 to 30 cases per 100,000 children per year. And the median age is four months, which is horrible. This is a typical scenario. An unresponsive infant is brought to the emergency department. This is a child um, who is barely two months of age. You can see the marks on the neck. There's really no story um, other than something happened, the child's not himself. Trauma response is activated. The child is placed on a cervical collar and we start trying to get the story. So mom says the child was well um, until about four or five days ago when he started getting subjective fevers, was feeding poorly. They had made a call to the pediatrician and uh, uh, were told to take the child to the emergency room. They did not do that until the day of presentation. And the story of the day of presentation was that at nine o'clock, the infant was placed to the bassinet by mom. 10 p.m., she went to check on the child. The child was sleeping, no problems. 11 o'clock, father heard crying, goes to find the child limp and poorly responsive. EMS is called. EMS arrives and finds the child in respiratory arrest and starts mask ventilation. The baby arrives to St. Christopher's emergency room. ATLS acute trauma life support is activated and the primary survey, which includes checking for ABCDs, airway, breathing, circulation, and disability finds that the airway is not secure, the baby's not crying, baby's intubated. The Glasgow coma score is dismal. The baby's pupils are four millimeters, non-reactive, not opening his eyes, not saying anything, not crying, not moving. The anterior fontanelle is tense and bulging. We find linear blistering abrasions in the anterior neck. There are some bruises um, in the uh, uh, neck area on the other side as well. And the baby gets intubated. Intraosseous line was placed and normal saline was started. The chest x-ray that was done to confirm ET2 placement already gives us a clue on what's happening here. You can see the red arrows pointing at the multiple fracture sites, including bilateral clavicles. And mind you, this child is one month. Trauma panels were sent. We want to check for elevated liver enzymes uh, to see if there's any kind of internal organ trauma. The child is now rolled over to the CAT scanner. You can see the CAT scan is not normal. There's diffuse swelling. You can't see the cisterns. This does not look like a survivable scan. The hyper dense areas uh, show tentorial hemorrhages. There's some splattered hemorrhages throughout the uh, parenchyma. In the bone window, you can see that there's a linear skull fracture. Children's skulls are very, very uh, pliable. So oftentimes you find no fractures, but there's significant injury to the brain. Now the baby's intubated. Hypertonic saline bolus is immediately given uh, when we see this picture. And 
by some miracle, the GCS actually improves and the baby starts moving. Baby's opening his eyes. The GCS has improved to nine. We still wanna keep a very close eye on the baby. The fontanelle is a little bit softer, but still not, not um, uh, to our liking. So we repeat the CT scan six hours later. Um, in this scan, you can see increase in subdural fluid. In the initial scan, other than taking off the cranium, there was really nothing surgical that could have been done. Um, but here we see a little window of opportunity to try to decompress those collections. The baby is taken to the MRI scanner immediately from the um, CAT scan that was already arranged. So we have an MRI that shows extensive injuries, extensive hemorrhages into the parenchyma. In the spinal MRI, the uh, upper corner, you can see a um, T2 weight imaging with stir. You can see ligamentous injury. And in the lumbar region, you can see subdural blood. The baby was too unstable to be taken to the operating room at this point. The hemoglobin and the hematocrit had dropped and it was at uh, 6.3 to 19.6. So we started transfusing the baby. Attention to ABCs in small babies is paramount as injured infants can suffer acute anemia and circulatory collapse. The normal circulatory volume in a small baby is only 85 milliliters per kilogram. This infant was only three kilograms. So the volume, the total circulatory volume of the baby was less than a uh, Starbucks tall cup, which is 350 milliliters. So you can imagine any blood loss can be um, fatal. We started gathering more evidence of abuse on the skeletal survey. Uh, as we saw earlier, there's bilateral clavicle fractures, multiple rib fractures, and multiple metaphysial fractures of different ages. There's no question at this point that this is non-accidental trauma. We mobilize our child abuse team, um, the authorities and child protection services get alerted. Um, this is really a multi-team approach. Um, our ICU um, gets prepared to take the baby um, and uh, uh, continue monitoring baby's vitals um, in a very frequent manner. Um, babies are a little bit different than uh, older infants in terms of uh, intracranial pressure monitoring. And we will talk about that a little bit later. Um, but the fontanelle is almost a window to the um, intracranial pressures. So we continue monitoring the baby's fontanelle. These arrows point to the fracture sites. This is classic in child abuse. Like we weren't traumatized enough by this case, a couple of weeks later, another child arrives. Um, this is a, a, a sequel of the, the prior case. Uh, so one week later, we have um, another MRI. And uh, this time we see that there's been massive volume loss and post-traumatic hydrocephalus. So um, ventricular peritoneal shunt was placed. We're gonna talk about the ethical aspects of treatment and how far to push treatment um, in the later part of the presentation, um, because one of, some of you may wonder, you know, what's the end point? Um, these children are gonna be extremely disabled. Um, why are we doing all of this? So in summary, the injuries, um, we have extensive bilateral mixed density, extra axial hemorrhages, we have extensive ischemic injury to the brain. We have cervical ligamentous injuries. We have multiple um, acute and healing fractures. 
cutaneous injuries, pulmonary contusions, and liver contusions. So again, two weeks later, we get another call. Um, this is a two month old, uh, this time that arrives with no history of trauma. Sometimes it's very difficult and there um, can be a delay in treatment if the parents provide no history. Um, this is a very classic case. Again, altered mental status, difficulty breathing. In the ER, the baby is noted to have seizure-like activity. Baby is intubated and the CT of the head is obtained, uh, but at the same time, uh, the treatment for possible meningitis is started um, because there was absolutely no, no, um, no history. So broad spectrum uh, antibiotics and the cyclovir were started. Um, but um, as we soon see, trauma workup revealed that this baby too had multiple injuries with fractures of different ages, retinal hemorrhages, bilateral optic nerve injuries, diffuse cerebral edema, and subdural hemorrhages. The first CT is not uh, so dramatic as the one prior, but if you look at this closely, you can see that this is not a normal scan. The systems are effaced. You can see a bulging fontanelle. The gray-white differentiation is lost, which indicates cerebral edema. Same thing, trying to treat the ICPs, uh, we see that there's extra axial fluid and uh, um, the, the hemorrhages are drained uh, by bilateral pearl holes and subgaleal drains are inserted. In the um, orbital MRI, you can see, um, and we'll talk about the imaging that we're doing here at St. Christopher's a little bit later, but you can see bilateral hemorrhages and optic nerve head injuries. In the lumbar MRI, you can see intrathecal hemorrhage. It's layering on the scan uh, as the baby is lying supine. Week later, same thing, progressive massive brain volume loss, increase in extra axial fluid. And at this point, the baby is leaking from the subdural uh, um, insertion sites. Uh, so we decide that uh, uh, um, um, we decide to insert a permanent subdural shunt. So abusive head trauma. Uh, here is a picture of retinal hemorrhage. Um, this is a, one of the hallmarks of abusive, head, um, uh, abusive uh, head trauma. Babies under one year of age are most vulnerable to the injury. Um, the baby brain is very, very uh, soft. It does not have the consistency of an adult brain. Uh, diffuse axonal injury can be very easily achieved by uh, a mechanism of shaking. Um, the abusive head trauma was formerly called shaken baby syndrome. It's a leading cause of fatal head injuries in children under two years of age. Also, the most common type of child abuse resulting in death. Most common trigger for abusive head trauma is crying. Um, the uh, uh, child's uh, uh, cry um, is normal, um, but uh, um, in, in especially very young parents, uh, it can be very disturbing. And uh, there's uh, other stressors, financial stressors, lack of sleep that can trigger this. There is no excuse, um, but uh, there are there are many uh, studies to try to figure out why this keeps happening. Um, there are uh, very common um, to have seizures. Two thirds of patients with abusive head trauma have seizures. Many are subclinical. So our children are always placed on EEGs. Early seizures are uh, predictive of poor outcomes. So, there's been a lot of controversy 
over the term shaken baby syndrome. And uh, until recently, um, uh, we, we uh, now call it uh, abusive head trauma for numerous reasons. So um, in the 1946, John Caffey uh, first documented an article associating subdural hematomas with specific injuries in pediatric patients. In 72, he postulated these injuries were due to a whiplash type injury that was sustained during violent shaking. Also noting retinal hemorrhages, bilateral subdural hematomas and encephalopathy that was pathognomonic for the diagnosis of shaken baby syndrome. This hypothesis was developed before statistical rigors of evidence-based medicine and it came under scrutiny and was criticized as flawed science. This led to exploitation by legal defense teams to confuse juries that this syndrome did not exist and these injuries could have been achieved in other uh, ways, uh, such as choking. Uh, these injury patterns were also difficult to replicate in animal models, especially hypoxia, uh, which in human babies is the most common neuropathological feature of abusive head trauma. Injury to nuchal ligament, which is the ligament that holds the head to the cervical uh, spine in the back was found to be injured in 78% of children with abusive head trauma. So it was hypothesized that hyperflexion injury causes transient neuropraxia that presents as apneic event. And uh, some of the hallmarks of these babies that we just looked at was the amount of uh, ischemic injury to the brain. So you know um, the, there's been a lack of oxygen delivery um, for, for, for some time causing this kind of massive swelling and massive cerebral edema. In 2018, uh, from the radiology literature came a consensus statement um, that uh, um, determined that diagnosis of abusive head trauma is a medical conclusion, not legal determination or um, the intent of the perpetrator or a diagnosis. Because of the etiology of this is multifactorial shaking, impact, et cetera, or combination of that, the best inclusive term is accidental head trauma. So when should we suspect child abuse? When there is no story and an injured child arrives or when there's changing story, um, parents are usually interviewed separately um, to try to get an idea on what's going on. Uh, if there's any suspicion of child abuse. Um, also, if the pattern of injury does not match with the child's developmental age, if uh, the, the, the parent tells you that a one month old rolled off the changing table, um, the stories that we've heard is a one year old brother plays rough with the baby. It's always the dog, the dog knocked, knocked over the baby Infant is brought in by someone who is not present during the injury, such as the other parent was home and something happened and now the other parent is bringing the baby in. Um, delay in presentation, or if there's been evaluations at multiple different facilities. Also, a lot of the times when we've had babies, when we start raising suspicion for child abuse, the parents want to transfer to another hospital. Prior CPS involvement or siblings that are in protective custody. And what are the suspicious patterns of injuries? Um, bilateral or inner hemispheric subdurals, also um, fractures, occipital fractures or fractures that cross suture lines. Uh, when you see diffuse cerebral edema, of course, retinal hemorrhages, complex skull fractures, Usually with falls, we see linear skull fractures, um, also epidural hematomas with just falls, but not really subdural hematomas. Bruising of torso, ears, and neck, especially anytime you see something like this in a non-ambulatory infant. The visible skull bruising, fractures of various bones, especially ribs, spine, scapula, 
or metal fusion bones. So um, uh, Dr. Giulio Zucoli is our neuroradiologist at St. Christopher's. Um, he has published extensively on novel MRI imaging to identify uh, key radiographic features of child abuse, such as retinal hemorrhages and torn bridging veins, um, which is the cause of subdural hematomas in these cases by using suspectability weighted imaging. And here you can see these these ratty looking bridging veins on the coronal um, SWI um, pictures. Um, and uh, here there are pictures of optic nerves, retinal hemorrhages. So this has been very useful to um, confirm child uh, uh, abuse in, in, uh, uh, in the cases that may have some doubt on what's happening. We have to be careful not to jump into conclusions um, because there are accidental traumas that may look like abusive head trauma. Um, falling down the stairs, the parent is carrying a baby, falls down the stairs, can look like an uh, accidental head trauma, but it's uh, almost always associated to external signs of trauma. In very young ones, uh, traumatic birth, uh, the classic finding is a tentorial subdural, which you can see here in the picture, A and B. Um, also sometimes retinal hemorrhages. And these always resolve uh, by the time the baby's a month old. And they're usually asymptomatic. External hydrocephalus, um, sometimes get cold, there's external extra axial fluid, the baby's head is growing rapidly. Again, usually there's asymptomatic. If it ends up being external hydrocephalus and there is a problem with the absorption system, uh, the presentation is um, uh, usually a papilledema that's found on the ep uh, ophthalmological exam, but not a uh, acute change of mental status like we see in child abuse. There are also some rare genetic disorders, as well as um, hematological problems that can cause uh, subdural hemor hemor uh, hemorrhages uh, and retinal hemorrhages. And one of them is glutaric aciduria, and here's an MRI that is classic for glutaric um, aciduria, where you see not just bilateral subdural hemorrhages, but also open sylvian fissures and basal ganglion necrosis. So those are the distinguishing factors. And we rely heavily on our radiology uh, colleagues to um, uh, pick those subtle things up. Uh, so what is the clinical presentation like? There's variable neurological signs, um, poor feeding, irritability, um, failure to thrive. Um, this can be... Um, seen in long standing abuse. Bulging fontanelle, uh, both of our babies had fontanelles like drums when they came in. Vomiting, seizures, apnea, um, coma. Half of the cases that end up being child abuse have no history of trauma. Um, so that's a, a problem and that can sometimes lead to, uh, lead to delay in diagnosis or misdiagnosis. So this is a busy flight, uh, a slide. Uh, this is uh, from our child abuse team. This is a uh, pathway on when to suspect uh, child abuse. What are the red flags? Um, there is uh, injury to the torso, ears, neck. Um, if there's a frenal or tear, uh, tear uh, if there's auricular um, bruising, cheeks um, that are bruised, eyelids that are screw, uh, bruised, if there's multiple bruises, um, again, um, fractures uh, that are multiple of different ages. The consults that we um, mobilize in our initial management is always social work, uh, the trauma team, the child protection program, and these are all reportable injuries, so they get reported uh, to the child line. 
uh, and a CY47 report gets filed. The skeletal surveys are done initially and then uh, several weeks later. Uh, even if the uh, skeletal surveys are negative, we'll always repeat them if there's a high suspicion of child abuse. The trauma labs include the uh, liver enzymes, CBC, um, and uh, UA. Um, poison control uh, is utilized if there's altered mental status or concern for ingestion. And sometimes um, abuse can be just severe neglect, medical neglect. Acute management of uh, uh, abusive head trauma. So it's the same as uh, we treating accidental trauma. We uh, always start with ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. We must pay attention to um, um, uh, hemoglobin, hemo, checking hemoglobin and hematocrit because a child can bleed to death uh, into uh, their cranium. Adults can't, um, but the child blood volume is so small that uh, any kind of scalp lacerations or, or extensive uh, uh, intracranial bleeding can re lead to their demise. We uh, pay attention to ICPs and maintaining cerebral perfusion. That's our first goal. Uh, the ICPs, um, the goal uh, to maintain ICPs is under 20 millimeters of mercury. Obviously in children, uh, the, the, the ideal thresholds are much lower. We use the fontanel in small infants uh, as our ICP monitor. Uh, once the cranial bones close, the uh, children get ICP monitors if their GCS is eight or less. Uh, the cerebral perfusion pressures must be maintained age appropriate. And then the decision is to see if there's any surgical intervention that may be um, helpful versus um, continuing with supportive care. Uh, there were new guidelines on no longer new, but in 2019, pediatric uh, uh, severe traumatic brain injury guidelines were updated. And the key points uh, were, uh, again, to treat increased ICPs and to prevent secondary injury from hypoperfusion or seizures um, while maintaining normothermia and electrolyte balance. Outcomes, the outcomes are terrible. Um, 45% neurological um, impairment in abusive head trauma versus accidental trauma, where uh, only 5% suffer uh, permanent neurological impairment. In series of 100 children who sustained head injuries, the mortality rate was 15 to 38%. The rate of Permanent cognitive deficit was 50% and only 30% of the children made full recovery. Most of those who survive are left devastated. They, are, um, um, uh, they have um, seizures, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, uh, spasticity, blindness, uh, you name it. Uh, uh, we see those kids and it's not, it's not fun. Spinal injuries, up to 75% of patients with acute head trauma, uh, abusive head trauma have spinal ligamentous injuries. 63% um, have intrathecal subdural blood. And this is a stark contrast to accidental trauma where only 1% of blood. So there's a I lot of complications. that happen while managing um, abusive head uh, trauma. Um, as you saw from the cases I showed, uh, the spinal fluid uh, absorption system gets disturbed um, and uh, many of these children develop uh, post-traumatic hydrocephalus and require um, spinal fluid diver diversion via VP shunt. Um, most of them also have problems with seizures. Um, status epilepticus um, can be very hard to break the seizures. Um, we keep the um, 
babies on EEG. Sometimes uh, they require multiple um, rounds of EEG monitoring. Just when you think that they're getting better, they start twitching again. Uh, we can we deal with infections. Um, young patients with craniectomies, if they uh, require craniectomy, they have a very high rate of uh, subsequent um, resorption of a bone flap when they get their uh, cranium back uh, via cranioplasty. Uh, the long-term problems, they uh, require tracheostomies, feeding tubes, um, many of them are wheelchair bound, uh, developmental delay, learning disabilities, seizures, hearing loss, vision loss, not to even mention psychological problems. Um, psychological problems are uh, really uh, um, uh, very, uh, very highlighted on uh, kids that are abused when they know better when they are uh, toddlers, five years and older, are found to have uh, uh, significant uh, psychological issues um, from, from abuse. Um, there's also cases that uh, um, I'll, I'll show you a case uh, of acquired microcephaly. When the brain doesn't grow, the um, sutures close early. So uh, what determines um, the size of the head is the growth of the brain. Uh, that's why we see kids with hydrocephalus have very big heads. Well, what happens if their brain doesn't grow? The, uh, cranial bones close, and then you have a very small head. So this is a one-month-old uh, who came in with a seizure and dilated pupil. There were conflicting stories from parents. Dad said finally that he dropped the baby on the floor, but obviously, obviously something more happened. Trauma workup revealed multiple injuries, including multiple rib fractures, and you can see this non-contrasted uh, CT scan here showing an acute left-sided subdural hematoma and diffuse uh, uh, swelling of the brain. The baby went for a craniectomy and um, um, in a uh, about a week um, and a half uh, post-injury, this is what the MRI looked like. Uh, that's the leftmost picture here. You can see the brain is herniating out and there's diffuse, diffuse loss of uh, brain parenchyma and gliosis. Um, so the cranioplasty with the bone flap that was saved was planned. And at the same time, a VP shunt uh, was inserted to try to get this herniated brain back into um, this skull uh, into the into the cranium. Initially, everything looked okay, and then a month later, the rehab brings the baby back with this picture. So you can see that the uh, brain has now died from the left side, uh, and there's this big fluid collection, and the uh, brain is herniating out from the defect. What you see here is just little tiny islands of bone, uh, which gave us uh, a, a picture of how quickly the um, bone resorbed on a child. I think the pressure that uh, was um, probably a non-functional catheter here uh, was given, wasn't helping. So with babies that are very small, there are very little options on um, what to do with uh, uh, cranioplasties because the implants that we use in adults um, are not approved in children. So I called uh, our uh, cranioplasty uh, um, makers and, and I was told that this is not an option. Uh, this is too small of a child. So, um, we got creative and we made uh, a cranioplasty from ribs. So this is a uh, intraoperative picture of, uh, looks like an apple pie here. These are ribs that are split in half and used to uh, cross the, um, the defect. Uh, in a child, they, uh, the, they, uh, the only bright side is that the uh, bone grows uh, very quickly. This would never work on an adult. 
um, but uh, uh, on somebody who is mostly consists of st uh, stem cells, um, this is uh, this is an option. So here you see a, a shunt valve as well. The shunt was revised, so the pressure was taken off, and uh, the bone actually healed. However, um, now you can see that there are sutures that are supposed to at least be visible are completely closed. So what we created here was acquired craniosynostosis and microcephaly and brachycephaly. And this actually the, the, the child, um, very cute, but uh, the, the head's um, kind of a funny shape. So this has been disturbing trend. Uh, this is uh, um, St. Christopher's Hospital um, uh, child abuse cases. So in 2019, we had five confirmed cases of uh, child abuse. 2029 with two fatalities. And in uh, this year, the first quarter, the first three months of the year, uh, we've already had two fatalities and six confirmed uh, child abuse cases. So this is, uh, this is disturbing. Um, why the increase? So co this, there's been a lot of uh, talk in the news about the COVID lockdown and increase in domestic violence. Um, and why would this happen? Isolation, psychological and economic stressors. Uh, people are using negative coping mechanisms, a lot of alcohol and drug use. Alcohol sales increased by 34% in the US uh, during the first uh, um, um, part of 2020. 91% increase in handgun sales during the first two months of lockdown. Also, lockdown measures allow abusers greater freedom to act without outside scrutiny. Um, in the US, large part of the suspected child abuse and neglect were made by school personnel and healthcare professionals. Uh, so now that's not, there's no, no uh, um, scrutiny from um, school or from doctors. Um, so a lot of these cases don't come to light until uh, uh, it's very severe, which is exactly what we've seen. Um, there's also been up to 30% increase in domestic violence. I think these numbers may be a little bit low. Who are the abusers? So we like to think that these are very evil people, but um, a lot of times they are just uh, um, are clueless. Um, they do not know that you can't treat, you can't uh, handle the baby and they lose their their uh, their um, patience and, and they, they um, get too rough with the baby. Babies are very, very uh, delicate when they when they first couple of months of life and shaking can create um, really bad um, injuries. So these are oftentimes parents with history of depression, substance abuse problems, very, very young parents, single parents. Income has been a significant factor in a single parent family, but not less, less so in a two parent family. Most of the time, there's other things going on in the household as well. Uh, less than 5% of the mistreatments occur in isolation. It's usually combined with emotional neglect, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, um, you name it. Long-term psychological effects, um, increased risk of depression, PTSD in adult host. And uh, unfortunately, um, the, there's also a vicious cycle. So those who faced violence as a child are more likely to become violent, uh, violent adults. What can we do? So um, in a micro level, we can educate our patients, we can educate our young parents, um, parenting classes, um, talk about the, um, the deleterious effects of shaking on young children. Uh, but on a macro level, um, you know, focusing on education, poverty, health, prog uh, health programs, including parenting programs. Um, the WHO INSPIRE report um, laid out seven strategies for ending violence against children. Uh, first was implement and enforce laws, uh, promoting norms and values, providing safe environments for children, giving parents and caregivers support, strengthening income and economic uh, uh, structures, uh, providing response and support services, and enhancing education and life skills. There is a, uh, a great cost also to uh, child abuse. 
um, the cost of inaction against violence against children is uh, very high. In the US, it's estimated to be over 70 million per year. Uh, globally, 7 trillion, which is 8% of the global gross domestic product. So this would uh, provide a, a heck of a lot of healthcare dollars uh, to take care of the sick. Um, there's a, a, a lifelong um, economic burden on a child that's injured um, because a lot of them um, get institutionalized. Uh, they require 24 seven care for the rest of their lives. And unfortunately, a lot of the times their lives are miserable. Uh, ethical issues. So this is really hard. And uh, I think this is the hardest part of taking care of these kids um, that we see. And uh, we always, first thing we, we start thinking about is, well, who, who did it? Um, somehow my, my PA, Cara, always knows who does it, who did it. Uh, I don't know how, how she does it, but uh, um, we've gone back in many cases and she's been right. I've been wrong. <laughs> Um, parents often maintain medical decision-making. So you know that the parents were involved, they were the only caretakers, yet they are the ones who are driving the care. There um, is always uh, the, the cloud of conflict of interest, uh, interest in the end-of-life decision-making. Even you know that the uh, case is futile, um, there's... there's uh, um, a parent who wants everything done um, and uh, understandably the uh, cr criminal charges could be escalated if the child dies. Instead of manslaughter, now it's gonna be murder. Uh, we rely heavily on guidance from hospitals, legal and ethics consultants. And uh, we always involve our child protection team, which at St. Christopher's Hospital uh, is, is just wonderful. Uh, they are. Uh, the most hardworking uh, doctors, uh, and they have the hardest job. Uh, it takes a long time to um, uh, investigate these cases. Uh, sometimes they lead to termination of parental rights, um, but oftentimes we see these parents back and, and it's painful. Um, it's very important to be aware of particular state laws that you practice in as well. In conclusion, abusive head trauma is a major cause of mortality and morbidity in children. Uh, diagnosis of abusive head trauma is a medical conclusion, not a legal determination, the intent of the perpetrator or a diagnosis. Early identification of abusive head trauma is important to prevent secondary injury to the brain. Again, time is brain. Um, the story is helpful. If we don't have a story, sometimes there can be a delay and it can be, um, uh, it, it can, the, the outcome can, can be affected by that. Child abuse and abusive head trauma are public health problems that lead to lifelong health and economic consequences. Healthcare providers are legally and morally required to report suspected child abuse. And to that note, I thank you and uh, um, um, I want to open the forum up for questions. Dr. Lovin, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, it was a great talk. I don't know whether I can even use the word great uh, for this, <laughs> for this topic. No. It is very important. Um, and I totally agree that on so many levels, we, you know, we would like that for this topic not to exist at all. <laughs> but unfortunately, reality is different and we have to be aware of it. Um, we have several questions um, when it comes to, the, to, to this topic. Now, when it comes to children versus adult brain injury, uh, can you highlight again the differences in their susceptibility to the brain injury or also the differences in the recovery? So, um, very good question. So the, the child brain is not fully myelinated um, until they are about two years of age. So it's much, much more prone to diffuse axonal injury with acceleration, deceleration type injury. Uh, the texture wise, it's much softer 
uh, if anyone's ever operating on baby brain versus adult brain, uh, you're talking about uh, pudding versus jello. Um, the baby brain is like pudding. Uh, if you have a brain injury and you see diffuse edema in the scan and you go ahead and you open the dura, that brain will come out like toothpaste. Um, it, is, uh, it, is, it is so soft. So you can imagine if there's any type of, um, any type of a share injury to that, it really, really uh, uh, gets injured very easily. That being said, children have much more potential for recovery. If that were to happen, that type of picture that you see in the CTs and the MRIs that I showed, you, show, you see that in adults, um, th those patients are toast. They, they're, they're not going to recover. Um, you know, children, children do have uh, an incredible uh, ability to, to uh, uh, surprise us. And that's, I think that's why we end up pushing the envelope and we end up doing these heroic things that sometimes work out and sometimes we, we regret. Um, but uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot lower threshold on operating on a child than on an adult. Um, is there any role in, uh, when treating head injury in children, is there any role in hypothermia or hyperbaric oxygenation? So, so that was uh, the, the, the cool kids trial was uh, stopped. So there was, um, there was a trial in hypothermia, um, but that, that didn't pan out. Mm -hmm. So now everything is, uh, um, the, the, you know, patients are kept normal thermic and, you know, everything normal. Okay. But again, good question. Now, um, without knowing any history, uh, you as an experienced physician, just looking at the injury types, intracranial injury types, what findings would point toward abuse of your trauma most strongly? Bilateral subdural hemorrhages, um, they usually do not happen uh, from accidental trauma. Accidental trauma, we see epidural hemorrhages, we see linear skull fractures, uh, bilateral subdural hemorrhages, diffuse brain swelling, uh, fractures that cross suture lines, and associated other injuries, retinal hemorrhages, um, long bone fractures, fractures of different ages. So it's really the constellation of combination of this, the, the injuries that eventually lead us to the conclusion that this could not have been an accident. The story doesn't match. Okay. Um, why outcomes in abuse of head injury are worse than an accidental head injury? Um, so again, because the accidental head injuries, the mechanism is usually not a uh, acceleration, deceleration that share injury to the brain. Um, that causes all of that diffuse axonal injury. And I think the component of um, hypoxia is also key because these uh, um, children all suffer uh, ischemic brain injury. Um, so there's the, the, um, there's the neuropraxia part from the shaking um, and, and the, the uh, injury to the upper cervical uh, spine that I think is, is, uh, um, is at play. Now, what do you do when you are on a fence if this is abusive or accidental? Uh, we, always, um, we always lean on the, uh, on the side of caution. So we, we gather more information and we get the experts involved. And the experts here are the child abuse physicians. Um, they, they have a way of interviewing um, the parents to uh, get the story out or get out enough that uh, it's suspicious. They interview the pediatricians, uh, family members, um, you know, anybody who's been involved in the child care. Uh, we have our, our uh, neuroradiologist uh, is uh, very experienced in 
picking up these very um, specific and subtle findings that cannot be anything but um, uh, but abusive trauma in combination with the other injuries. Uh, like I showed showed uh, uh, the um, MRI findings of the um, tear, torn bridging veins and uh, retinal hemorrhages, optic nerve injuries. Those usually those don't really happen uh, in a accident setting. Now, do you have any in these cases, uh, aside from of course treating uh, and reporting these cases uh, to the child abuse team, do you have any other role? Any what? Any other role in these cases? As you know, you obviously you treat, but then and then you report. Do you have you know when it comes to decision making? So, you know, uh, so uh, the the, uh, the the child abuse team here takes care of all of the legal um, uh, uh, work. Uh, I I can be called. Uh, I can be subpoenaed uh, to testify, but most of the time, uh, the judges here work through the child abuse uh, abuse physicians. I have been subpoenaed to testify in child abuse cases, um, you know, elsewhere um, that I've been involved in. Um, but it's 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 good to hear that we have, because we have su such a high volume of cases that we have a actual team yeah. handling it because it's very um, very traumatizing, very time consuming as well. Um, and uh, again, I just wanna say that uh, I think this is, uh, this is such a hard um, um, problem for not just um, everybody involved, the nurses, the, the physicians, uh, that we, we all have like these little um, debriefing sessions against uh, after, after really hard cases. They're very disturbing. Oh, I can I can imagine I can imagine Dr. Levin, thank you very much. It was it was really you know the, the topic that everybody needs to hear. It exists and as as much as we would not want. But thank you very much for the talk. I and, apologize uh, for ruining yeah. everybody's morning. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to you know invite everybody to join us again in two weeks, where our neuro, uh, neuropsychologist Dr. Lester and Dr. Gallo will be talking about. Actually, their topic will be as a neuropsychologist. So see you in two weeks. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Bye-bye.